Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, this is a regularly scheduled meeting of the uh, Select Board of the Town of Sunderland. I'd like to call to order January 1st, January 17th at 6.34. First up is approval of minutes of January 9th. I motion we approve the minutes of January 9th. Seconded. Okay, motion made and seconded to approve the minutes as presented. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying yes, aye. aye. Yes, aye. Three zero, Jeff. Next up, we're going to start the arduous beginning of the budget. So we are joined this evening with the uh, Finance Committee um, in... Do you want to start with the police or fire? Uh, fire, if that's all right. Uh huh. All right, Mr. Fire, give us your best shot. You you get us to kick off. You're your number one batter. The dubious honor of leading off budget season. You got. You get us. A, you knock out this. You get the first pitch. Soft, soften everyone up. First. Yeah, you get the softball. All right. Well, appreciate the time this evening, and I just want to. Start with a couple of stats, nothing that's necessarily tied into the budget, but because um, I don't come before you often, I wanted to mention a few things about number of calls, number of hours, and that sort of thing. Um, we are right now, uh, well, after we added everything up for the calendar year uh, 22, we ended up with 156 total calls. That's 147 fire calls and nine EMS calls. We customarily get invited to, or we get called to the uh, more serious EMS calls to support South County. And the good news is, as far as actual fires go, we had uh, very low monetary losses in town, no losses of life, a few close calls, but um, we had a, a good year from that respect. Um, another interesting thing, about 5% of our calls are overlapping, meaning that we're getting into a situation where we're on a call and we have another call. We've got to figure out how to, how to um, deploy resources and cover both of them. And the, uh, the average for calls, average time for calls, is also starting to creep up in terms of the time on scene, the time cleaning up, uh, more and more of the time following up afterwards. And the um, as far as responses and so forth, um, for personnel, pretty healthy. Um, nobody made every single call, but we've got um, folks that made 109 calls, folks that made 60 calls, 40 calls, uh, 75 calls. So there's certainly a pretty good group of folks that are, are responding on a regular basis, which is good. And next up, the, the number of man hours person hours, number of hours that we keep track of for, um, uh, for training is another interesting stat. Uh, and this is everybody's time added up. Uh, over 1,200 hours a year we spend training. And that's a mix of uh, EMS training, fire training, uh, split fairly evenly. Uh, a third of it is um, NFPA standards, firefighter one and two. Um, a quarter of it is truck checks, making sure equipment's in good running order, familiarity with equipment, and then the balance is for uh, first responder training, medical training, and uh, driver training also, getting people familiar with the equipment. So, any questions on that information? Right. So I prepared two spreadsheets. Uh, one was the level funded spreadsheet, and the other one was the expanded services spreadsheet. Do you have a preference on which one I start with? Why don't you start with levels, Stevie? Start with the level. Okay. Starting at the top with the level funded. Now, one thing I did send in, um, I had to rec do a little extra work to reconcile all of our encumbrances from the uh, from 22. So. Forgive me for sending that spreadsheet out. I think it was on Saturday evening. But regardless, that's only for two accounts, the Town Park account and the Fire Department expense account. Uh, but going down from the top, public safety complex expenses, um, asking for level 
funding. Uh, so far, we're at about 43% of our, uh, our spend for the fiscal year, which is um, about where I figured we would be. Uh, we've got some uh, pretty hefty oil bills that we've got to uh, digest through that budget. Um, and we're doing, you might say, the bare, not the bare minimum, but we are uh, only handling the, uh, the most serious types of maintenance items that are coming, things that are broken, things that aren't, uh, aren't functioning well and uh, are gonna be, uh, gonna impede operation. The, uh, the fire chief wages, no change there. The fire department wages, no change there. We've got uh, a little more than half of those wages spent for the current fiscal year, which is about where we expect to be. Um, that's always a bit of a moving target. Um, fortunately, I was granted some, uh, some more funds for that in previous years, which has helped us to get to, to, to you know, being more or less halfway through now. Um, but there were some years where I was doing three and four capital um, uh, reserve requests, which was a challenge to corral everybody. But fortunately, we're, we're, we're in a good spot uh, as far as we are. Part-time firefighter wages in the office, no change there. Um, about halfway through there, that um, leads us into expenses. I have asked for another thousand dollars in expenses, uh, going from thirty-three to thirty-four thousand uh, dollars. The reason is we are really starting to get. Uh, oh, my mistake. That's a level from twenty-three. Getting ahead of myself, but uh, we are running into challenges for costs and expenses on even the, the run of the mill things, fire extinguisher recharges are getting more expensive. Just everything that we're buying is going up. It's no secret to anybody, but it seems like uh, anything that has the word fire or public safety involved with it, it's expensive to begin with. And then it's gotten even uh, a little bit even more rich as time's gone on. Uh, civil defense, that's our radio system or the um, uh, the reverse 911 system. That's um, something that a lot of town departments use for uh, mass notifications to residents and what have you. Uh, there's also a, uh, a functionality there. Should there be a, an event in town where we've got to notify everybody or certain parts of town, uh, we can dice that up. I think Chief has used it on a few occasions before to uh, have notifications about road closures or other emergencies. It's a neat system, and for, uh, for what we pay for it, uh, it's a good value. Uh, the radio system, the next one down, uh, I've asked for level funding, but we haven't gotten the bill yet. So we don't know exactly what it's gonna cost us. Chances are <coughs> it's gonna be in the neighborhood of the same, uh, the same amount of money. Uh, the story with that is we've got a new radio system that we're all working off of uh, as far as communications. Uh, the state police 800 megahertz system that we have a trunk on um, franklin county is the the beta as far as the county-wide deployment of that is concerned it's going okay uh, there's a few wrinkles everybody expected that the reason that this line item still exists is because the old radio system is used for paging and dispatching fire departments so steve can you call uh for cog tomorrow and ask him for Projected cost for the yeah. for the radio. Okay, thank you, Stevie. Yeah, it's probably going to be about the same. I haven't heard of any major. I, I haven't either, but. but no. <laughs> I, I I don't want to make bets, and and they should they they understand that. So, I know they postponed the FERCOG postponed their budget one month because of some other meeting, but they should have those numbers. And they should be getting those out. So I, I did reach out to them because I, I wanted to make sure we had to pay it because we are on new radios. And they said the budget's going to the FERCOG Council in late January, not ask for an increase in revenues from the users, meaning assessments will be level with last year. So it should be good. It should be good. And the, um, the upshot is as soon as we're able to uh, run paging off of the digital platform. That radio system will go away. Uh, we'll see what happens with the assessment. 
there'll be some decommissioning costs and so forth, I'm sure. But um, that's not a um, that's not a, uh, a forever cost that we should have to bear. And then the town park, um, I've asked for an increase with the town park. Um, we've had good luck with that property. There's been uh, quite a few repairs. The Fireman's Association has underwritten there maintenance and what have you, but we're, we're running into a situation specifically with trees, where we have some problem trees that are uh, overhanging power lines, and it's beyond our expertise to remove those trees. Uh, we've got some pretty good uh, <coughs> talent on the department with people that cut down trees for a living, but we don't possess the equipment to take care of those safely. So, so when you're saying they're overhanging power lines, are they overhanging like the service, yes. okay, versus the yeah. So, so we keep, we can't go asking every source to do that. Or, or. Uh, we went that route, and they were kind of polite, but we didn't really get what we were looking for. Yeah. And and honestly, to, to take down a tree like that is over a thousand dollars anyway. So it's um, um we're, we're we're taking the worst one and uh, you know kind of work back from there. Yeah. We have used the, the, the budget monies from the past. We've used for some maintenance, but also for some improvement. We, um, at the very end of the season, uh, in the fall, we purchased some uh, some plants at a local nursery that was willing to cut us a deal. So we'll be uh, expanding the, uh, the, the flowering plant selection up at the town park in the springtime. Around the sign in the front or down into the park? <clears throat> Probably with the size of the plants that we obtained, probably into the park, but the sign does need a lot of work also. And our hope is that as soon as the weather breaks in the spring, we can get in and at least do some chopping and get rid of some things, perhaps uh, evict some of the poison ivy that's growing in there also. Yeah. And uh, make that a little bit more. Work. So you're planting like on the embankment where the stairs are or? Where are you actually doing plantings out there? We're going to do some plantings as you're coming in. Right now, the plans are for some plantings before you get to the pavilion when the, uh, the road breaks off to the left to go down to the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Some plantings there. And then another area in the back, almost on the, I might call it the northeast corner of the cleared area. Um, we're thinking of placing a bench there with some other plantings. Uh, it's a fairly popular venue for weddings, and mm -hmm. a lot of folks are commenting that they don't have that "quote unquote" spot that they could have their their um, photographs their, and their stuff. Photos yeah. and their vows exchanged and so forth. So that's not the end of it. We expect to, to continue that, but that's what we have coming for the uh, for the immediate future. So, any questions on the level? Yeah. Um, did you say you were asking for an increase in the? Park budget? Yes. Because I don't see it yeah. on either sheet. It's zero. 1600, 1600. Uh, for, yes, my mistake there. For dollar changes, but looking back, nope. Caught me again. There was nothing on this one. Okay. Do you expect the 1600 to be able to handle the tree work then, or is that something that? It probably will, and I say it probably will because um, we've been talking with some folks that are willing to do work at a discounted rate. Great. And as long as we can get them early enough, yeah. that should cover the um, that should cover the, uh, the cost of that. Wonderful. Thank you. And if not, we'll we'll figure something out. We'll hear from you again, I'm sure. <laughs> probably. So, moving on to the expanded services, I put together. Can I a couple quick questions? Just so, sure. so you're saying level spending through the budget, which is great. Even in a year where inflation is pretty high, so you're anticipating next year would probably be a kick forward. So, Joe, I, I don't know if you saw this or not, but when we sent out the budget memo, <coughs> we asked the departments to submit two budgets, uh -huh. a level services and an expanded services. So I think that the chief's going to talk about sort of the expand where he would spend more money if it was available. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And the uh, my 
my, my, um, my thought was the level funding was just talk about where the money went and then expanded my, my, my thesis on the additional funds and what they're needed for. Well, actually, Steve, it's a, it's a very good question. Le level funded, it, it doesn't mean it's all the same. It means that you're, we're providing level services. Well, so and, and, and that and that that can be so sometimes that's you could have a ten percent increase, but that would be just to maintain the services that you're providing right now. So so that's one of the things that we need to do a better job of making sure that you know department heads know. Well and the you know the I suppose the definition of level funding, level services, I appreciate the explanation. But I figured that with the opportunity for an expanded services uh, budget as well, you know, the, uh, we're probably our own worst enemy with the fire department because we, we tend to make do yeah. with a lot of things. The problem is um, so much of our spend is cyclical, meaning that from year to year there may not be a jump, but uh, in four years when a certain piece of equipment becomes obsolete legally, we need to spend, and because we're not able to save year over year, um, we're not able to really plan for that. We're gonna to come to you and ask for it. So, um, much appreciated conversation. I put together a sheet that talked about, uh, talks about the three areas where I've asked for the, uh, the largest increases, you might say. Or, uh, Increases that wouldn't uh, maybe intuitively be, uh, be necessary. So what I'll do is I'll just go down starting at the top and then I'll reference the sheet. Certainly if you have any questions, jump in at any time. Um, but for the public safety complex expenses, uh, I've asked for um, going from 27, and that should have been 33,000, not 36. $6,000 change uh, to cover increases in uh, utilities, but also uh, we haven't waxed floors in probably five years. Um, we've got some other items that really need to be taken care of. And uh, up until recently, our budget's been consumed primarily with utilities, oil, uh, electricity, the phones are very expensive. To, uh, to run them. Jeff and I have spoken on a few occasions about modifying that phone system uh, so we don't have it uh, as quite the, uh, quite the siphon on the funds that it is now. And we'll, we'll figure that out. But um, that's not going to amount to an awful lot of a, uh, awful lot of a difference. So, um, Quick question for you. Um, obviously, you guys share public safety complex. Are you, am I going to see a line item for you for your half of it? I, I just, this is my first time doing this, so I'm not sure how that's broken down. Whether this that's is the first time I've submitted anything. I, I did put in a request to do the cleaning and uh, why not cleaning the waxing and the ceiling mm -hmm. of the uh, floors on the police side. Okay. Um, I had gotten a quote from a company that does the cleaning services now because uh, no one else was able to provide a quote, and I put that into a capital expense, but not in a budget. The budget is from here. All I did was submit a capital. Okay, great. Thanks. Appreciate it. And yours, you broke it down by rooms, too. Did you say you did some this year and some next year? Is that what I read? Or uh, on the police side, we would be separating it to two different days. Otherwise, we'd have to shut down the police about yeah. for the full day, and I don't know how we could do that. We'll just tell everyone not to commit crime for the day. Yeah, you know? they, they, they It'll work great. Right. Yeah. And on, uh, on my side, it would be, I suppose, she could have loaned on. It's one of those things where if, if we don't find a way to accomplish that, um, we're, we're going to be replacing four tiles because there'll be one through and so forth. Um, for fire chief wages, no change. Uh, Full-time firefighter wages, unused at this time. For deputy uh, chief, this was the old uh, assistant chief wages line item from about five years ago. When I was in that position, and Chief Ahern and I were, were splitting the stipend, I've requested a small stipend for the assistant chief 
as my job's changed in the last five years and as the uh, uh, assistant chief has worked his way up from being a captain uh, to his current position, uh, there is opportunity for him to both um, lighten the load on me at times, but also there are things that, uh, that he can focus on that would not normally be within my abilities with the time that I have. Um, a lot of things with the um, uh, community outreach, he's very good with, uh, with things like that, events, um, uh, helping with our SAFE program that's being managed very well by a, a lieutenant right now, but um, having somebody like uh, Deputy Zioli involved would be a great help for that. The other thing that is uh, is coming up quite a bit are some other projects that um, we have thought of, uh, other town entities have thought of different things with, um, say, signage on Mount Toby, different, uh, different efforts with fire ponds and other sorts of uh, town resources that if, um, if I try to tackle them by myself, it's still gonna be a couple of years. Uh, because as my, uh, as my life is getting increasingly consumed with code enforcement and uh, uh, following up on things like that with the building inspector and with the state, uh, my ability to do some of those other things has been diminished. So uh, that works out to a handful of hours a week for the, uh, the deputy chief likely see some good results from that in short order. The, um, the next increase, I've asked for another $2,000 of wages. Uh, wages. So, so, Steve, when, when you do co code enforcement now, do you charge for code enforcement? Well, there's the issue of code enforcement where we go and do an inspection, yeah. like the liquor license inspection, yes. But there's also a significant amount of time spent where you go to a fire call and you see a violation. And then you've got to notify the property owner who may or may not be um, an absent mm -hmm. landlord. Um, calls, emails, registered letters, um, subsequent inspections. Um, if they don't, you know, if they don't um, respond, then you've got to involve the state. Department of Park Services for assistance, and it, it turns into just time, uh, two, three hours a week, four hours a week. Oh no, I. But Jeff, that, is that something that that we can look into about capturing those costs? Yeah, we can look into it. Yeah, I mean, if you're spending time doing that, we can charge a, a reasonable amount of time based on the amount of work. Or, or, or building it, build it into the build it, build it into the fee structure under the 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 building, you know, the building inspecting code enforcement. Okay. And and and, and again, and, and it's just I'm not saying it's good or bad or the budget, but for something to recoup those expenses because most of our most of our inspectional services are for fee you know we it's it's a wash when you know what i mean right the, the challenge is in quantifying you know you get a um we've had several instances um one was um a residence where we were called for a carbon monoxide alarm nobody was there um turned out that there was a um, there, there were a couple of things going on there with appliances that weren't right mm -hmm. and Yes, I suppose we could find a way to recoup the costs involved in notifying that resident yeah. that this is wrong, that's wrong, you really can't have things this close to your, your wood stove, uh, what have you. Um, but unless we look at another conversation for another time. But mm -hmm. um, trying to quantify and identify every situation that may come up and find a reasonable way to um, yep. no, absolutely. that would be tough. Because it's hard to, to respond to somebody's house for an incident 
and then send them a bill afterwards. Yeah, uh, that, that's my hesitation is just I don't want to do anything that's going to make somebody who's poor not call the fire department because they're worried that that's going to end up being a charge that they're going to have to assume because that's when people die in fires is when you know people don't call the ambulance when they're sick because they can't afford it or they don't call the fire department because they're worried about FBE. So. And even beyond that, and that's a good point, but um, you get into there's time required to research things. Maybe maybe everything's all right, but it still takes an hour or two to look through, look through the codes, check with the building inspector, make sure that um, that this appliance was properly permitted at the time. Um, it's certainly there are some ways we can recoup it, and then there are some ways that it's it's going to be uh, perhaps a bit of a stretch to go back and, and recoup. And there's also uh, the program um, through the state uh, ticketing program. Um, it's a little bit more involved, but there's ways that we could we could get some of it back, we get some of the um, get some of the funds back. Are there fees or codes like for commercial buildings like Blue Heron or you know, the huge apartment buildings that you you inspect those once a year? Is there do those landlords pay a fee for that or the herb? Yeah. definitely. So you, and that's yearly, right? Those. Yeah, that's annual, and then there's reinspection fees and, and so forth. And the, uh, the challenge is, um, with some of those properties, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. So you go in one time, things will be fine. Then you go in another time for an alarm, and there'll be storage in the stairwell, and then there'll be, you know, I've got a couple of uh, ideas also that I'll talk with Jeff about for um, some things to bring up at town meeting. I'll go so far as to say some bylaws about contact information for landlords um, because there's some mm. where we, we've gone and they've been, they're not, um, they're not urgent problems, but there's problems, say with an alarm system, it takes us four hours to get a hold of somebody. And that's, you know, it's unacceptable. They, 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 they were, that party was built for it and it paid. They paid the fire watch fee, but still, um, you know, having everybody tied up for four hours is, it's not, uh, not the way we want to do business here. So, anything else on that one? Thank you, Stevie. The wages, I asked for another $2,000, and really the, the, the way that <clears throat> that might show itself as an expanded service would be uh, to stay on scene for a little bit longer. Instead of me watching the uh, watching the clock and saying, "All right, we're, we're we're at about an hour by the time this all is said and done, and we're, we're running short on on payroll, and it's it's May, um, we're going to uh, we're going to take off, and um, not that we're not going to leave the job undone, but instead of spending an extra 20 minutes with everybody there talking with the homeowner about." fire safety or helping somebody move something out of the way. Um, maybe the, the deputy chief and I go back the following day or in two days and have another conversation. Um, but having a little bit more money in the payroll for all the firefighters would allow us to, um, uh, to stay, stay a little bit longer, have an extra conversation, that sort of thing. A little bit more you might call it. Uh, go so far as to say some more customer service versus what we're able to do now. For part-time firefighter wages, asked for uh, another $2,000, and this would not necessarily be a raise in terms of hourly pay, but additional hours for that person to work in the office. What we're finding is the, um, the amount of public um, Records requests are increasing. The, um, the amount of time required to apply for grants is increasing. And just overall, uh, it's funny, we used to uh, fill out paperwork for, uh, for the state, and it was relatively benign. And there was an incident. They had a, a list of things that they needed to keep track of these. And now it can take uh, quarterly, it can take five or 10 hours just to review everything. Because if there are mistakes, the state wants them corrected and then sent back. So it's uh, it's just growing in a uh, in, in a lot of different directions for that one position. So this will help alleviate it with another hour or two a week for uh, for that party to uh, get 
some things done. And quite honestly, that work is getting done now, and um, that's over and above what that person's being compensated for. For apartment expenses, another four thousand dollars is uh, being requested there, and that's going to cover our uh, it's going to cover our inflation. We've identified that the um, bunker gear that we're using now is uh, the, the, uh, the setup that we have is ideal. Uh, it's a nice mix of value and performance and like everything else that's going up. The other thing is we've got um, several junior firefighters at this point that we'll be looking at attending uh, either the fire academy in Springfield put on by the Commonwealth or some of the local uh, county fire training, and in order for them to participate in either one of those, they've got to have gear that's within date. So effectively what we're looking at is, um, in our, our fleet of gear, if you will, out of 20 firefighters, if we have 13 that are interior qualified, um, we're going to be bumping that up to probably 15 or 16 in the next year or two, and they're going to need current gear. We buy gear every year, but instead of two sets of gear a year, every few years we're going to have to buy three sets. So this will uh, this will help us accomplish that, and we're going to end up with um, more firefighters that are, uh, that are capable and trained as a result of it. The next three, <coughs> no uh, no changes on those. questions or comments about uh, the last few items so when when you uh, when you went uh, redid the term assistant chief to deputy chief did you did you also include a new um, job description I haven't been able to find the job description from the assistant chiefs way back when okay but um, the so whatever the chief doesn't do is not a good description, then, right? No, no. I thought about it. It's a great comment. But, you know, and the, the, the challenge is also the job description is probably going to depend on how much of their time Absolutely. is going to be compensated and how much isn't. So I weighed, you know, what, what we would do. So I figured I'd see what the effort type was for a small stipend. And mm -hmm. then we can... Um, Perhaps structure the job description accordingly, but right now it's a uh, uh, the, the tasks are pretty light, if you will. So uh, Mike isn't being asked or uh, demanded to do an awful lot uh, until we get that whole thing. No, I just, I just, I was just wondering if, if, if you were, th if you had thought about, you know, kind of. I've, I've, thought, well, I've thought about it, and I know we have a process for putting those together and formalizing them. You know, some, sometimes it's easy with your in, in your department to understand what the, the differences are, but sometimes, you know, it, it is you, what happens when you're not there. It, you know, they're, they're just it may oh, yes. it may it may it's all understood until it's not understood. Sometimes, I guess. No, very true. Okay. And, you know, certainly, having you know, having the title. Um, is important and as far as uh, activities and those things that one might intuitively think that an assistant fire chief might do uh, on a fire scene or what have you, um, those are relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Mike's been doing a nice job with those. But okay, see. to your point, Tom, some of those other items are, uh, are, are important to flush out. Okay, thank you. So I'm all set. Uh, Nathaniel, Crystal, questions? Good. I'm good. Finance committee? All set? All right. Okay. All set, CB. Thank you. Thank you. Chief? Chief, Chief. A lot of chiefs in the room. Okay, thank you for having me over as well. Uh, <clears throat> To go over the, the budget, the, uh, the expanded services, uh, the only difference between that and the level services would be an increase in hours for the police clerk. Um, so I can go over everything and just 
touch on the, uh, the police clerk wages uh, as we get closer. Uh, but as far as the uh, employment wages from the chief, the full-time and the part-time, uh, those were all contractual, so whatever was agreed upon uh, should reflect those increases there. Um, then when we get to, uh, to overtime, that only went up uh, two and a half percent because of uh, the increase with the officers' hourly rates. Uh, so if they do work overtime, that's why that went up. Uh, remember last year we did cut some of that, we cut some of the part-time budget to make some uh, room for a full-time officer, and uh, that officer has been working full-time since, uh, since the beginning of October, and uh, we're very happy to have him on with us. Uh, when we get into the expenses, uh, the expenses show an increase of uh, $4,400. Uh, that basically breaks down to $1,000 for fuel. Um, even though, yes, I know we did just purchase a hybrid cruiser, um, but we're still on track this fiscal year to uh, go over in fuel at the rate that we've been going. Uh, so we're hopeful that the hybrid cruiser uh, replacing the gas guzzling towel that we had uh, will help alleviate that, but to try to stay on track with what we've been doing every year, we want to make sure that we have that buffer. I know last year I did put in for that $1,000 increase, and that was um, not authorized, um, but we have other avenues to replenish that if we need it. The other increases for the expenses, um, <coughs> the other major one, was for the uh, IMC system. I, IMC is a uh, operating system that we have been using uh, since the 90s, um, in 2018, we merged our system uh, to <coughs> our police reports, incident reports, accident reports, arrest reports, uh, and utilize the dispatch log. We merged with the uh, regional dispatch center in 2018, and our in-house system, if you will, went from just our entry to being able to see the entry of all the uh, 24 towns that work with that system. Uh, so that's been a huge increase for data information, for officers when they're doing investigations, and trying to reach out to people, um, and then creating that database of not only just our residents, but people that may be coming through town that we can utilize uh, information for. We're not tracking people, we're not doing anything like that, it's just an in-house system. Uh, and in that system, we can see if I, if I uh, dealt with somebody this morning, we could see if another town dealt with that person um, over the weekend. Whereas, <clears throat> if, uh, if I get stopped, by, let's say, Charlemont, and I got pulled over and I got a ticket, I wouldn't necessarily see that, or the officer that stops me in Sunderland wouldn't see that on my driver history, whereas the in-house record would reflect that because it's all out of the same dispatcher. So uh, every year for the past three years, the state has covered 50% of the bill. We are expecting this fiscal year to be the last year, and it's gonna start slow, we're gonna start paying more towards the final number, so this year is going to show uh, uh, the increase, and then this fiscal year that I'm requesting money shows another increase until we bear the full 100% cost for Sunderland uh, on that system. Do you know what the 100% cost would be? I think right now the 100% cost of that system for us is $5,200, and okay. right now my budget is going to be 24. Oh, <coughs> no, it is 3,000 for this year. Okay. For this fiscal year coming up. Gotcha. So that by 24. Um, so in a couple of years, uh, or by uh, 25 or 26, we would be picking up the full cost of that. And that basically covers us for the mobile systems that we have in the cruisers, the access to dispatch, and the access to records management. And records management covers all of our uh, uniform crime reporting we sent to the state, uh, as well as the accidents, police reports, and arrest reports. So we're looking at maybe another $3,000-ish if when we go, go from 50 to 100 percent of that yes. over the next couple of years then yep. okay great thanks uh the other increases were uh, negligible you know 150 dollars towards ammunition uh dues and subscriptions and um uh inflation for uh, equipment inside the, the station whether it be paper to supplies that we utilize to uh, maintenance on the cruisers the cost when we bring it to a you know getting four sets of tires when I started here six years ago, four sets of tires weren't anywhere near the $900 it cost now. Um, but we've been watching that go up. Um, so that's the, the $4,400 increase for uh, expenses. As far as the police clerk wages, the level services shows a continuing on the same 30, 
Um, 30 hours a week for us. She gets four hours from highway. My hope is that we would be able to expand that to 36 hours. Um, still having the four from highway, therefore totaling 40 hours as an employee. Um, a lot of the stuff that she's been doing, I give her credit, she's been doing a great job for the last uh, over three years. She helped uh, coordinate a lot of things within the building, working with some of the employees from the fire and the police, to working on some of the outside projects that you've been by the station you may have seen, uh, to really being on me to make sure that we have a lot of the grant reimbursements done. Uh, she handles all the payroll for the police department and then all the filing records requests, things of that nature, it goes through her. Uh, she'll check up on with me on a lot of the um, stuff that may be a little bit more uh, labor intensive, but for the most part, she handles uh, a lot of that and uh, uh, fits along great with the uh, the staff and we absolutely love working with her. Uh, she's done a great job with uh, uh, from where she started in the beginning to now and she's really made it her own. So uh, I know that the hours, um, She's packing in a lot of things in the 30 hours, and I think bringing it up to 36 hours would give us a nice 40 hour number for an employee, but should be able to then either, either offer longer daytime services or come in on another day uh, to therefore give us uh, the amount of time for citizens coming in and uh, dealing with the police side of it. Uh, like I said, discovery requests, DCF requests, report requests uh, from the insurance companies to anybody in town that needs a police report. Now, is she considered full time currently at 34? Yeah, so I think over if you over schedule tw or 20 or 21 hours, you get full time okay. benefits. But she is uh, at 34 now. So, what I think the only thing that's different is the way they calculate time off because of how many days per week. Okay. Versus but our town expenses, in terms of the other expenses like health insurance and stuff like that, should be I believe it's all consistent. Yeah, okay. Still full time. All this would do is just increase the hours. Yeah. Um, I don't. I, I didn't increase an hourly rate for her because that, that's usually based on what the town supplies. Uh, historically, they'll they'll decide if it's going to be a skip this year, if it's going to be a two percent, whatever. So this just reflects what she makes physically now per hour, but adding six hours a week, therefore totaling the six thousand um, dollar increase for the year. Okay. Great. So going to go up from, from a total of thirty to thirty six. But again, I always have to bring that up. She gets four hours a week from high. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that's, I, I've learned in the last six and a half years that I, I talk quite a lot and I can keep you here till nine o'clock, trust me. But um, I figured I'd just bring it right to the point. These are, these are the services that we're looking at increasing. Um, like I said, the payroll side of it is all contractual that we've already agreed upon with the exception of the civilian clerk. Uh, that's where my request is coming in to add that additional six hours. And the expenses, like I've explained, is the fuel, the IMC upgrade, I'm sorry, the increase, not the upgrade, the increase, um, and then some of the smaller increases for ammunition, office supplies, and maintenance. Um, but the, that is the bulk of the, the police budget request. Um, I have put in a capital request to look at doing some stuff on the police side. Like I said, I've been here, uh, luckily been here for just over six years, and the same paint swatches are on the walls that were here when I came. Uh, the same floor stays, it still looks the same. So we, uh, yeah, the cleaner comes in and, and cleans twice a week, but uh, the floors are, are getting uh, quite, a, quite beaten down. So we're gonna have to really look at sealing those so that way we, we can avoid future problems uh, and maybe even try to get some paint, especially in the paint cell, in the gel cells. Uh, the gel cells, We've been received demerits or received a point off for the inspection of the cells because they say it looks dirty, but it's not dirt. It's just the paint is wearing out and the concrete is showing through. So we need to paint those over again. If we want to start with those rooms, then do the booking room. And if we're able, if we have any money left, to work our way out towards the front office. Uh, but if not, we'll just do it in stages. As far as the cleaning and the ceiling, that would be um, the jail cells, the booking room. Uh, that day we would have to have the officers, if they have an arrest, to do services at another department for that night, uh, Deerfield, Leverett, Waitley, whoever's available, uh, or even state. Uh, and then the next day they would come in and do the front half. So the administrative office, the hallway, the coffee area, uh, and the officers room. Um, and we, we can coordinate that in two days, but the, to try to 
push it all through in one day. It's basically, hey, everyone go home for the night and uh, we'll have state police come on. And we don't think we can do that. So. And you're estimating that about $3,000? Is that what you're? I think that's what the capital expense was. Um, yeah. I know historically capital expenses are over 5000 but um, I didn't want to throw money into it to make it look better. Uh, it's just, I, I want to save 1500 for uh, the cleaning and the sealant and then another uh, fifteen for paint. And, and the paint was just, we're going to start small. We're looking at jail cells, get those done. And we're not looking at doing the entire room. We're looking at doing the beds, benches, and the uh, floor, um, and then work our way out to the booking room, because that, that room's used the most. The officers are in there all the time, from police reports to uh, processing fingerprints for residency cameras and FID cards. Um, some people come in for uh, FBI fingerprints because they're getting a job elsewhere. The only ones we don't do are teachers. It's not my decision, it's the law, we can't do that. Um, but then people will come in for, uh, obviously, uh, under arrest uh, in those situations. So um, that room would be the second room that has to get done, but that's the cost between the, the two projects that we're looking at doing. Uh, luckily, we had ARPA money authorized to, to work on some of the front facade of the building. That is already gone underway, and um, the sign is almost done, and then we're gonna get the contractor to do the underlying work before the sign can be put back on. Uh, and as you know, uh, the ARPA funds was used, some of it was used to purchase the hybrid cruiser, along with the Green Energy Committee and their uh, their grant. So that is now here, and it's out there. You can see it. Awesome. Chief, did you want to mention the ACO budget, too? Or did you want to put it? Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry I didn't have it. So the ACO budget, uh, as you know, we, we hired an ACO um, a little while ago. Um, in that year, the ACO was hired sometime in October. Um, uh, so we kind of went without one for July, August, and September, and most of October. Uh, and that budget is still in order. Um, the amount of calls that we had, the amount of follow-up that the, the ACO had uh, accomplished, and also attend some of the training that first year, put the, excuse me, put the budget over. Um, this fiscal year that we're in, um, we're right on track um, with uh, going in the red. Um, so the ACO budget, uh, after going back and forth and seeing what costs were there from the Franklin County Sheriff's Department op office that we utilized for the dogs, uh, to any other calls, uh, the amount of services she's been able to provide and going forward and, and trying to return calls and be present at, at on scene instead of doing follow-up later. Um, we figured a thousand dollar increase, so that's going from 4,180, I believe, uh, to 5,180, and uh, that should help um, put us in a better spot to reassess the services for the ACO going forward. Um, I don't believe in the last six years that I've been here that that was ever increased. I think it was increased before, uh, and I think the hourly rate was added or increased, but the stipend that that person gets every payroll has stayed the same. Um, it's just the amount of hours that she's been putting in uh, just shows that there's been a, a, a higher call volume. As you all know, because we've been for a dangerous dog hearing recently. Uh, so she's been involved with that and going forward. And, and the officers, you know, I, I have to take some partial blame to this. My officers are calling her for things because uh, they feel comfortable with her. So she can handle a lot of the investigations and they have a great relationship. Um, not to say that we didn't have that before, but the call volume seems to be more now. People are stopping us, calling us, so then we transfer them over to her uh, and go forward from there. So her call volume is now. So we think that's going to continue um, going forward. I just don't know how much, but I think that the $1,000 increase to that budget would reflect the, the where we were lacking in the previous year and the year we're in now. So. Any questions about that budget or the police budget? Yeah, no, I... I the uh, ACO, I mean, that's just that's just plain math, you know. I mean, people people call because of certain things, and they we got to provide a service. So, yeah. and we don't live in a, a major metropolis. We do have animals, sometimes wild, running around, and we get calls for that. So, she gets called if the officers are, are able to assist, or if the officers aren't able to assist, she can come out more. Um, and as far as the police side. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's self-explanatory from what I've said so far, but like I said with the uh, the quarter hours, uh, 
uh, we definitely need to increase our hours to, to cover a lot of the, the time spent um, uh, of her working. And uh, I think we'd be able to utilize that more, not just as a resident, but as a uh, department head and, and, and seeing how much she's able to do within her hours. And I think getting her up to a 40 hour of work week would assist us as well as anyone else that would need our services. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. I'm trying to do it quick because I know you guys have a 715, so. Okay. Nathaniel? Crystal? I'm good. I'm good. Looks like all very reasonable requests. Finance? So how's your hybrid vehicle working? It looks beautiful. It's, uh, I had to say uh -oh. that. Uh-oh. That's not a good sign. No, no. Uh, only be, I, I have to say that because some of the officers were trying to buff it up today in case anybody wanted to see it, so it looks beautiful. Um, but, of course, it takes some time, so we have to show some of the people, hey, when you turn the key, there's not that turnover that you traditionally hear with an engine. So we remind them, turn it once and then wait, and you'll see all the bells and whistles come on, you know it's working. And then when you put your foot in the accelerator, that's when it all kicks on and you can drive. Um, it's uh, uh, the, the response I've received from the officers that do primarily drive, drive it are night and day compared to the vehicle they had before. If you, if you want, you can come down to the station and I'll let you drive around the parking lot of the uh, police station because it's got no more plates. Of the old one? I, I don't, Crystal, no. The, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. You I really want me in a car? I'm saying, I'm saying the old one, not the new one. <laughs> so you can hear all the dings and dents and bangs and, and noises that were in that last one. Uh, this one, if you want to ride with me, I'll drive you over <laughs> um, and show you. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, now the fleet looks almost so, exactly the So same. what did you, what, what would you get, what was your, I, I, your, the way you use a car, there's many hours just idling. idling. Yeah. Now the idling does no longer occur. Well, it'll idle until the battery level drops, then the engine will kick on to help yeah. support that. Um, but the gas usage, the fuel consumption is going to be uh, night and day. The Tahoe, last, year, last calendar year, the Tahoe used 1,760 gallons of gas. The department used 5,300 gallons. So the Tahoe took almost, a, 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 took the majority of it. Because the next vehicle is the one that you see on day shift, and that one is 1,350 gallons. So 400 gallon savings, and that's a gas vehicle. This one we just purchased is a hybrid. So this one, should we should really get more gas, miles per gallon, and we should start seeing a better return on vehicle being used versus just soaking up all the, the fuel. Um, so idle time, it, it's a little bit different than, say, an electric cruiser. Um, some of the uh, uh, departments that have been able, since our last sit down last year. I've been able to ride in a couple and talk to some of the officers and the chiefs that have them. Um, you know, the concept and the idea is great for an electric cruiser, at, but it's at 215 or 220 miles per charge up. And then when you add all the police equipment in, it drops it down to 180. And that's just not conducive for a town of our size. We would have to buy two or three at once and at 70, 80 grand a piece, we're not doing that. Um, but who knows, next year, the Lightning might become something that's out there instead of the Mach-E. Um, maybe the Mach-E becomes a better vehicle. Um, but this vehicle in particular, the hybrid, gives us the, the, the more miles per gallon than we've historically seen in any of the cruisers that we've had. And then um, the fuel consumption has been, I think, a cost savings for the town. So you know, the finance, I'm always looking for ways to get income. So mm -hmm. we're saving a lot of money. Does that, where does that savings go? Is it? I mean, I think unfortunately this year it probably is just swallowed up by the increasing gas costs for the rest of the vehicles, most likely. Well, so right, but that's because that's of the gas price, you know, up and down pushing. But, but in the long run, can those savings be kind of somehow put aside to buy a new vehicle? The, I mean, you're saving, mm -hmm. you said 1,500 gallons? It, that car itself, um, so the car we've just got rid of, yeah, it was seven, 1,750 gallons. Times. And then, yeah. and then the, the vehicle, the next vehicle that was the highest was thirteen fifty. So that's four hundred gallons difference. Right. And I, I believe that this new car will reflect that four hundred gallon savings, if not more, because right. it's a hybrid. Right. So the, the, I mean, there's savings there. It's, it's going someplace, right? Yeah, it stays. It, it stay. It's it stays in our expense. It stays in the police yeah. expense. Yeah. So it's, it's in the expenses. And if we don't use it, it goes back to general fund. If right. we do use it, um, yeah. 
if it doesn't get used, I mean, can it be allocated to a future purchase for another hybrid? So, Joe, I, th I think, <laughs> and I'm going to steal a, a solar phrase. It's not. <laughs> We're not reducing our costs. No. We are saving. We are what? Oh, and I lost the phrase. Avoid avoided costs. Avoided. We are avoiding additional costs. We're not actually saving any money. So, um, as much as I would love to give the chief more money for the department, it's more. Um, it's it's not actual savings. That makes and, sense. And and, but your your point's well taken because and and that's part of it, that's part of the discussion when you when you go. On town, when you're when you're explaining budgets and the and the money how it's used, that that's where an engaged finance committee or a board would be able to tell the residents of town, look, this is you know you you may see an increase here, but those costs are being offset by the savings, and 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 that's really why you have engaged finance committees and 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 your and your select board. Because most most time, now when I first started, it was a little different because you had people that went over the budgets with a fine tooth comb. Um, but more more and more people don't have the time, and as our budgets can become more complicated, you don't you don't have the same amount. So. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to give it a year and see what it actually uses for gas, yeah. what the maintenance on it actually costs, yeah. because the maintenance might be well, a I, I saw increase. Officer Peters, I think he was his first night that he had the vehicle. We bought it Thursday night, and he was the first one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and one second, Wednesday, so Brendan had it, Sergeant had it, and then Brent, uh, Officer Peters had it the next night. And I, and I saw him, and, and he was just, he just understand, because it's a learning experience for them as well. And and I had a bunch of questions for him. It was like, okay, you're sitting on side the road. What happens? And well, he says, well, most of it's just running on batteries now. Plus, you also ch you have a battery that you separately. It's not like plugging in your car, but there's another. So you don't have to plug it in, but there are two batteries. So if if, if in three, four, or five years, if somehow we have to jump it, um, I actually put out a, a email that explains that you have to take the stuff out of the back. Um, and then hook up your jumper to the back of the car because it's the back battery that we traditionally have for yep. the front of our cars. And then on the front is the hybrid battery. Mm -hmm. If you just jump the hybrid battery, all that's going to do is get you to the station, and when you shut it off, the car's dead again. So you have to jump them both. Um, but when you're sitting on the side of the road, you know, if I, today I sat and did radar, my car was running. Now, my cruiser's a little bit different. For the first couple of minutes, it's got that um, idle sensor, so it stops until I take my foot off the brake, and then it starts up again. Whereas some of the other cruisers, like the, the midnight shift and the day shift, those cars are just all gas. They don't have any of those extra features. So when you sit on the side of the road, you're, you're burning gas. And you can't traditionally just shut it off, because when you shut it off, the blue light shut off, the radio shuts off, the radar shuts off. So you need those on to hear, to get dispatched, the radar to see if everyone's speeding, and then the blue lights if you have to activate them. This car operates on a hybrid uh, mentality between them both and it utilizes the battery services until it gets to a certain level, and then the engine kicks on to replenish that. So you'll save, it'll use battery until it needs gas, and then it'll use gas, and then it'll go back and forth. So all they gotta do is drive around town, brake a couple times, charge that battery back up, well! Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that, that would be more of like the electric cars, but I, I think in this car specifically, uh, it, it was interesting. The minute you got in, you turn it, you sit and wait, you want to go reach for it, and you can hear everybody say, no, 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 because you'll be cranking it again. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Gone. It just, it, you're turning the car on, but it, it's smart enough to know not to engage the engine until you need fuel or you need to go. Um, so, you know, they, they've had it now a week, and I'm sure they've put it through some interesting uh, things, but um, just the sheer fact that it's new, but the line of sight, the fact that it's not making noises or creaking as you're driving, is a godsend, and, and I haven't heard a complaint yet, so that's great. And what's the plan for Tahoe? Is that going to stick around as a backup cruiser, or is that going to be a sold? No, that is the town. Uh, the, we were not getting a, enough money back as a trade-in, mm -hmm. so I think the town can use it as surplus equipment, whether you want to give it to another department or you want to auction it. I think the town could get anywhere between no less than $1,000, if not up to three or 4000 
because the used car market is huge. Mm -hmm. We yeah. were not getting that on the uh, trade-in. Yeah, this is a good time to sell a used car, so yes. that would so, probably be a good plan for us. Yeah. I have the key sitting on my desk with the key fob, um, and we have the paperwork, so whenever the town wants to do it, the blue lights have been disabled, so um, all that needs to be done is someone can peel the stickers off the front or the side, and they can make it their own. We still have the radar, I'm sorry, the center console and the prisoner cage, um, but if somebody wants to haul stuff, they can use the prisoner case to haul stuff. It, that cage won't fit in any cruiser uh, at all, so we, we couldn't use it. Um, and then the center console was for the towel, so we weren't going to use that. Uh, but everything else that we need goes for a ride, and then you'll have the. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if, if it was a much better shape, I would highly suggest that you guys would try to utilize it for maybe animal control. They could put dogs and cats and bears or whatever in the back. But um, with the amount of things that are needed for the upkeep, I think it's better for a civilian to upkeep it than a municipality. Yep. 166,000 miles, uh, that truck would still go uh, for anywhere between two to four thousand dollars in the used car market. Yep. Um, so that's something the town would get. We would not get it as a police department, mm -hmm. that would go to the town, but it's surplus equipment and the town would decide where they want it to go. Okay. So we'll probably look for a uh, declare surplus. Yeah, the chief and I started a conversation okay. about the okay. vehicle and other stuff. All right, any other questions? I'm good. All right, Chief. I'm always around. You gotta get a hold of me. Just don't call me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you much. Have a good one. Thank you. All right. Chief. All right, mass of motion presentation.
and it has been uh, taken on by AARP in the United States, and Life Path has taken on this regional um, initiative here, um, and that encompasses Franklin County and the North Carolina region. Um, and the reason why we're, we're taking it on is that we are just aging more quickly than ever before, and we're recognizing that communities can do something about that to make it you know, more age-friendly. Um, by 2030, 34% of Franklin County will be age 65 or older. Um, and around the same time, there will be more people over 65 than age 18. Um, and that's for the first time in history. So, you know, it's kind of just sobering about where, where population is moving. Um, so AARP has set these eight um, domains of livability um, in which this age-friendly, you know, puts initiatives in buckets. And so slide three um, demonstrates, you know, housing, outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, communication and information, civic participation and employment, respect and social inclusion, health services and community support. Did I ever say social participation? <laughs> but those are all buckets in which age-friendly work can happen. And we don't expect work to happen in all of those buckets. Um, but that communities will be choosing which bucket makes the most sense for their communities to um, work in. Um, so, okay, thanks. <laughs> so now I'm going to introduce kind of mass in motion in general, and then later on, after Carol talks about the data, I'll get into some specifics about um, what's expected of the towns and what's expected of us. But Mass in Motion, if you're not familiar with it, it is a statewide movement that promotes opportunities for healthy eating and active living in our communities, in the places that we live, work, and play. And communities all over the state are doing different things with their Mass in Motion initiatives. Mass in Motion has been in existence in the state for over 10 years. Franklin County has um, been involved for just over 10 years. I've been the coordinator, but we recently had a um, sort of a re-upping of the funding, and at that point, the people at the state level decided that they wanted fewer mass in motion communities with more funding. So we applied over a year ago, December 2021, Sunderland was one of the towns that signed on to support our application. We applied to the state and then we found out probably late May that we had been awarded the funding. And what we decided to do in Franklin County, because we have so many municipalities and most of the mass in motion projects around the state are limited to one municipality or maybe a couple of municipalities. Um, so we're working on a regional level. We decided that um, what might be most useful is to do something that would complement the regional age and dementia friendly work by providing support directly to towns who are interested in developing their own age and dementia friendly plans. So we applied for that with the 11 towns. We were awarded that, um, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute, or in a few minutes. But um, I just wanted to sort of reinforce the idea that mass in motion is complementary. It's not. It's not replacing. It's not competing with the, uh, the regional project. So Carol and I uh, are in touch almost every day, and I'm on her steering committee. Um, and and I think that there, you know, some people were worried that uh, because I was communicating with the towns about mass in motion, and they hadn't heard from Carol yet about. Um, the data that somehow Mass in Motion was replacing the regional effort, and I just wanted to put that idea to rate rest. Um, but some things that are significant about the way that Mass in Motion works is that we're um, really focused on health equity, which is the concept that your health is determined by many factors, and when there are inequities, things about um, different uh, different neighborhoods having different access to resources or people being discriminated against for various reasons in their community, that also affects health. So um, we really try to focus on improving health equity. We try to change community conditions by looking at long-term solutions to the root causes of issues rather than staying on the surface, oh, this is a problem, let's deal with this, let's try to understand 
what is really underlying that issue and dealing with that. Um, and Mass in Motion uses a leading with race framework, meaning that we lead with race explicitly but not exclusively. And again, that's, um, and we'll, we'll give much more information about how that works, but it's the understanding that race, which is a social construct, is at the heart of a lot of inequities uh, in our communities, even in primarily white communities. So it's really important to understand how that works. And I will pass it back to Carol and say more later. So today we are here to share um, survey results about uh, Sunderland specifically. Um, but our regional initiative uh, focuses less on each specific town, but four different areas. So housing um, and outdoor spaces, transportation, um, communication, <coughs> civic, and social engagement. And the fourth is healthcare, healthcare and community supports. So that's, those are the four pieces that the regional um, um, initiative are focusing on. And so in this survey, um, you know, different things bubble up for different towns. And so um, if you're looking at the uh, slides, you'll see that the black ink uh, refers <coughs> to the regional numbers, and the red ink refers to Sunderland numbers, OK? So we don't need to go through every slide unless you'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> I might see it shaking your head over here. <laughs> um, and How much time do you want to spend? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but just to give you some super highlights, maybe we, we do that. Um, so just wanted to share that 56% uh, of respondents from uh, Sunderland were female and 16% were male. We don't know who the, the other people can identify themselves. <laughs> But what we know is that you know it's heavily um, a skewed for female. Um, we also know that uh, in Sunderland, um, a higher percentage are reporting that they live alone um, than the regional sample, um, and uh, that is something to consider. You know that you have a, a, a decent sized population of people who are living alone. But other highlights um, are that. Sunderland respondents cite a greater need to make changes if they consider cost of living um, or the cost of maintaining their own home. So that was kind of an interesting you know, pop out for Sunderland. Um, generally, residents are more satisfied with their access to public spaces and the accessibility of outdoor spaces as well, traffic signage and pedestrian crossings. Um, 100% of your 25 respondents reported driving themselves to places. They're not leaning on other people to <laughs> drive them. Um, but you also have 27% more than the, um, than the regional sample who are people-powered. They're on bikes. They're on foot. They're reporting that that's how they get around. Um, so you all have more people doing that than the regional sample. Um, Several uh, respondents are reporting a lower rate of receiving caregiving support. So you have less people telling us that they're receiving caregiving. Um, although more Sunderland respondents feel they have less access to healthcare professionals and less conveniently located healthcare services. Um, so, you know, looking at this data, you can kind of you know, pull it apart in different ways. Some of it is contradictory. Um, and you're going to know some of the cues that come out of this um, survey data better than we would, you know, looking, looking at this. Um, you know, digital access and literacy are strong in Sunderland, um, but there are opportunities to tap to many willing respondents that, that came through the survey. Many Sunderland respondents feel financially secure now, but a larger percentage than the regional sample worry about their financial security in the future. So, um, you know, that's something to consider. Um, so, I guess the <laughs> Sunderland rates less positively in respect and social inclusion themed questions. Um, so, it looks like they could, uh, you know, be interested in more of those kinds of so I noticed in your transportation mm -hmm. that you, you in, in here, it says that regionally 2% or 0% report using special transit 
like senior center van. That's an interesting. That's an interesting number because, as as a member of the PBTA, we we have demand service. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, if you know to go like to a doctor's appointment or, you you can call up and get, that service and it's, the ride right. Yeah. And it could be that the twenty five people who responded. Well, I, and, and, and yeah, and we yeah we understand it, but I, I think it's an interesting number for us to know. It's good because we can talk to PVTA about their outreach to our community about the demand service that obviously is not getting out there, mm -hmm. um, and so so maybe we can make make a note of that, Jeff, so that we can talk to you know, the PBTA people and say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe, and, and again, we, we, and again, it's, it's hard for, to communicate, as you guys know, to <laughs> communicate to everyone. Um, but we have to do, a, we have to do a better, better job, or they do. Across the board, too. You know? Oh, I, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I looked at it, and, and, it, and, it, and it's funny because I know I had to, I was running up to Greenfield a couple times the last couple weeks. I had to go up to a, a place up there, and, and I, coming down, because now there's only one way to get really across the Connecticut River to get to Greenfield, although that's supposed to be changing shortly, um, but every, every day coming, that I was going, coming down the hill was a demand of a, a GMTA an, an on-demand vehicle and I see your numbers and that's not reflect again it's not reflected but it's they do the same thing that the Greenfield Montague Transit does the same type of stuff so oh, the, Frank, the Frank FRTA yeah yeah the FRTA it's a little tricky though if you have to go between the two you PVTA would take I'm leaving the lines in all over the circle. Yep. Will take me to the Circle K, and then I can't get GMTA on demand. I have to take the bus from there. Right. Really? I don't live there, so it's a little complicated. And then on demand, from the way I understand it, it might be different visually impaired versus age. Mm -hmm. I am 55 too, so I'm kind of <laughs> <laughs> full disclosure. But you have to be within a certain distance from the closest bus stop, or you don't. <coughs> and that's there's paperwork done. To, to, like I'm right on the border. Mm -hmm. It's three quarters of a mile to get on, the, and it, it's contrary to what you'd think. It was, if you're inside of 0.75, you can get on demand. If you're outside of it, you can't get on demand. Hmm. You would think the opposite. If you're farther, is that away, true? For visual impaired, it is. Yeah. I don't know. It's for age. I, w I was just told a story. Someone who lives in North Quabbin, I think, in Phillipston. She has a bus come through from Templeton to go to the grocery store, you know, for exactly this kind of service, but it won't pick her up because it's a different service provider yeah. in that <laughs> next right. town over. Right. But they're coming through there. Yeah, I guess the, 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 the summer be people need help, you're saying, like, the, yeah. the, the, to, to understand and be educated in how they can get to some of these mm -hmm. outreach programs, and it's complicated. And, PBT, it depends on who I get. I mean, I call some of them, they're awesome and really help, some are not. So, you know, the Commission for Blind helps me navigate it, and I assume that the Senior Center would help others navigate it, I would think. Um, but, you know, I don't know, I decided to get a sidetrack. <laughs> no, it's all related. The, the survey was 50 and over, right? Is that? It was, mm -hmm. yeah, 15 over, or yeah, caregiver was, right. was part of it, but the vast majority were people over the age of 60, yeah, that were responding. That responded, you sent it to, 15 over, right? Yeah. I think that's right. That's what I think. I think I, I might be one of the ones. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. One yeah. of the 25. Yeah. How was it administered? Um, so it was mostly in electronic yeah. Yeah, distribution, but it was also made available at COAs and libraries, and people could request it from LifePath, Life and we would mail it to them. So it's, it's definitely it was skewed that way, too. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the transportation um, work group for the region has started, all the work groups have just started their first um, session out of six um, through the end of March. And um, the facilitator leading the transportation is from the FERCOG, 
and she um, came up with a spreadsheet because that was one of the questions that her um, her participants were asking, like, what is available out there? You know, how many services can people draw on or call on to make life a little easier um, or accessible? Or, um, and, you know, she had something from a few years ago that she wanted to share, and they were going to look at it to see, like, what's still out there working for the community, what, you know, what sounds cool that we want to bring back or request, you know, bringing back. Um, so those conversations are definitely happening as a result of this work. Okay. Oh, back to me. Yeah, I guess. We've had, so like I said, we did some highlights here. <laughs> it's a little confusing when I'm throwing numbers at you, but you have the, the paper. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you have the paperwork to kind of go over that, and I can send it electronically if you did. We've got it electronically, don't we? Yes. Yep. Yep. And if you need us to send anything additional, you can Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. So back to measure motion. Thank you, Carol. Um, so I wanted to talk about the timeline for medicine motion. And if you look on the second page of the memorandum of understanding, that kind of outlines the scope of work. And I realize that. Um, because we're meeting in January, it doesn't give you uh, as much time as other towns have had, but I think it should still uh, work out. Um, so the timeline <coughs> for this is to first to have an initial meeting with the select board, because the select board was the, the body that agreed to sign on to this to begin with. So we needed to come back to you um, and review the process that, that we'll be going through. The first thing that we're asking the towns to do after this meeting is to convene a work group. You know, a, a handful of people, six to eight people, it's, that's really up to the town. Um, we're asking you to invite people who um, have lived experience with uh, being uh, older adults, with having a disability, with being in a group that might be discriminated against. Um, and, you know, we're trying to make sure that the voices of folks who aren't always heard are heard in this process. Um, and the work group, we're, we're asking each town that's involved in Mass in Motion to send at least two people to a health equity training, which will be taking place on February 21st in Greenfield at the, in the Transit Center conference room. We're gonna try to get registration information out by the end of this week. Um, we have a snow date for that. It's December 7th, and the timing of the training is 9.30 to 3.30, and there will be breakfast and lunch. So, March 7th, right? What did I say? You said December, December 7th. Oh, I'm sorry, March 7th. Yeah. So the, the date of the training is February 21st, mm -hmm. which is a Tuesday, yeah. and the snow date is March 21st. And these are daytime things? These are daytime things? Yes, 9.30 to 3.30, and okay. the um, snow date is March 7th two weeks later. <laughs> um, and those are at the, uh, the transit center in the conference room. And ideally, it would be a couple of folks from your work group that would attend this, although the training is open to other people. If you want to send more than two people, that's, that's also fine. Um, then after, uh, after that uh, training, then we'll ask the work group to convene and um, you'll meet with me and potentially other folks from the COG to review this data. So um, we have more details about the data to provide. Carol has uh, provided you a summary of the quantitative data from the survey. We also have some qualitative data that came from focus groups, so we'll have a report about that to share. Um, we also have um, our evaluation coordinator who has um, been able to look at the data and tell us things like if you live alone or people who live alone are more likely to fill in the blank. So some details about that which are really interesting to look at. So we will ask this group to uh, look at the, um, their data from the regional assessment and do um, what I'm calling ground truthing which is a term I just learned about a month ago which is to say, okay, is this accurate for our town? If only 25 people responded to the survey, is this, is this an accurate sample? Are there other details that we might wanna fill in? And I'm particularly interested in some more details about food access because that was not asked 
in the mm -hmm. um, regional assessment, and that's really important. Um, and uh, so food access, where people are getting food, how difficult is it to get food, and also food insecurity, which I'm sure is a factor for residents here, but um, it's important to ask about that. Uh, then, uh, after looking at the data, the group will identify what are the most compelling issues in this town that, that need to be addressed. Um, they'll look at root causes of those issues to really try to get at what, what needs to be addressed in order for this issue to change. Um, and then propose some strategies. So by the end of June, we're hoping that each town will have a strategy or two that they want to work on. Um, we are providing funding for this work group, $4,230 up to that, and that's specified in the MOU. And that can be used for anything related to uh, supporting this group. So it could be used to pay somebody to convene the group or pay people to attend the group meetings if that's what would get them to attend. It can be used to pay for transportation, food, meeting equipment, um, meeting space, whatever, whatever it is that you need. It can be used to compensate people for attending the health equity training. However you want to use the, the funding, it can be used for that. And then there will be at least that much next year, which can be used towards implementation of the strategy, but we understand that $4,000 is not enough to implement a strategy, um, a very significant strategy. So if, if you come up with a plan, we have some support at the FERCOG to um, apply for funding, and we can also look at what funding might be available. So, um, so that is the process. Um, the uh, the one of the things that's significant in mass in motion is that we always in looking at any existing policies or systems or programs or in contemplating something new, we always ask what we call the racial justice reframing questions, which are for any given policy or practice, who benefits, who is harmed, who influences who decides, and what are the unintended consequences? And as you can see, those are great questions to ask for really anything um, when you're trying to think about equity and who has access and who has power. It's also on slide 22. Yes. Um, and I wanted to mention one other thing, which is that we are aware that um, Waitley, Deerfield, and Sunderland all work together on the Senior Center and you know, have collaborated on age-friendly work over time. So um, I have also been in touch with the Senior Center Director and um, some other folks who have been involved in uh, South County age-friendly strategies. So we are having a meeting with those folks this Thursday, I think it's at 2.30, um, to share uh, some of the, the, the three towns data with them. Um, you know, like Carol has a conflict, but we're gonna we're gonna work something out so that we can have a meeting to share with this group as well. Um, and so we realized that um, we wanted to come back to each town select board because those that was the body that signed on to the uh, application. But we we also want to make sure that we're working with um, the three towns together. So each town will have its work group, but if the towns decide very quickly that they want to consolidate the work groups and work together, that's fine, but we wanted to give each town an opportunity to form their own work group and make their individual decisions. I think that's it. Are there questions? No, that's a good, it's a good idea talking with, uh, with the South County. I mean, the last, over the last year, we've, in, we've increased uh, participation by over 100% there. So it, it's the, and as we, try to come up with a location a permanent location it but moving out of where we were to what we're doing now while not ideal is still better than where where it was before so and and it matters it matters to now 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 the people that go to the center have room to do things right. before it was much more limited so I think the other piece, you know, the approach of the age-friendly work, we do think about people over the age of 50, over the age of 65, over the age of 70, but any improvements or planning or, you know, 
anything related to be friendly across the age spectrum. You know, if you decide to put in a bench in a, on a walking route, you know, that doesn't only help someone who needs a rest, it helps a parent who needs to tie a shoe of their kid, or mm -hmm. someone who has just had surgery and they, you know, need to, to take a break or two. Um, so that's one of the things that I love about this work um, is that we have a focus because we're aging rapidly, but that the benefit is across the age. So and here we are at the 17th. So the first meeting's in a month. How, and maybe the question was slightly before, obviously I'm interested, but um, how is the group going to be put together? Do you, are you going to put it in, in bite? People from the library, from the town, from the group, you get a month to pull together. You set a group up to seven or eight, two or three would go to the training. So um, we are asking the towns to take that on, yeah. to form that group, because we want to make sure it's not, yeah. it isn't up to us to pick those people. So we're the last, you said we're the later ones. Where have the other towns gone to? Um, well, I can give you people. an example. Uh, yeah. Cole Rain just like put out an advertisement in their newsletter, um, and then and then there was also word of mouth. Um, I think a lot of towns were just using word of mouth to recruit people and saying, "Oh, I know someone. I know somebody." Um, I, I think some towns use the library. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we made some flyers and put them in the library, the yeah, South County Senior Center. You know. Library. Yeah, center. town hall, uh, here in the town offices, that kind of thing. I think that'd be probably sufficient. I mean, the question is this slot board. I mean, how, what is, how many Sunderland residents use senior center frequently? I mean, is how many use it? Yeah, right. I mean, is it is a good number of Sunderland? Yeah, yeah. And, and if you find actually, uh, Jennifer, the director, yeah. will have number specific numbers because we're they use a thing called my senior center now yeah. so that's it's actually tracking before it was done by by pen and paper but now it's when people come in they actually will sign in with their my senior card so if you if you went and if you're to senior center you would sign up and you get a my senior card and when you go in to any, any of the services you would so now we'll have when, when Jennifer comes she'll give you a sp the specific numbers on 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 how many are being used but you're, you're right that it is a short timeline between when the training is so having identified those, those people and then um you know by the end of june is kind of when this first round of you know the four thousand dollars is that right rachel Should be spent? Mm -hmm. yeah and that is flexible like the last thing that we want to do is force towns into a strict process that's about sort of checking off boxes. I mean, this is this is about the future of the town, the future of people's lives. If it takes longer, if the planning phase takes a little bit longer to get to uh, a decision about what strategies you want to implement that So minimally, you want two or three people to go. You said you said really the 70 person committee, that doesn't have to happen. No, it doesn't yeah, have to happen before the training, and, and it doesn't have to be that many. I mean, I was just giving that as a sort of throwing out a number. You don't want, like, so many people yeah. that you can't make decisions, but you also don't want so few people that a tiny number are making decisions for a large group. So I, we really leave that up to the town. I think towns have a, a good sense of what sort of makes an appropriate number of people and who might be appropriate, and, they, and you know, people can... Um, join that group at any point. I mean, we're not particularly strict about that. We just want a group of people that are really interested to meet with us, and we want some folks to attend that training because that's that's going to kind of kick things off in terms of this whole concept of health equity and, and what are the things we need to think about as we're doing this work. You're not concerned about the training being daytime hours when many people are working and wouldn't be able to well, we're concerned, but um, we're hoping that of the the group that is selected, there are at least two people who would be able to attend. Okay. So, Jeff, do we want to come up with a flyer or something like that and start getting out there? We don't have a lot of time before the training, so I don't really want to wait a couple of weeks to get it started. So, do we... Do we want to get that going and get that out in the couple locations, or...? 
put something out in the Greenfield recorder or um, I don't know because that's not typically how we recruit for committees we don't just put out a call um, so we could if that's what the select board wants to do um, or we could identify some people who have been involved and ask them um, but yeah I mean it, it wouldn't take very long to put out a flyer and put it up in the post office and the library and here and um, and when, you can and we'll talk to Jennifer and you can get Jennifer to put it in this the uh, the monthly senior notice also so if you yeah, wanted to I say to I contact me you. by a certain date if you're interested and then I can bring it to the to select okay. board and, that sound, is that what yeah, that, that's sort of what I'm just. I just don't want to wait until our next meeting to discuss it, and then have one less week to recruit people if we were looking at a, a timeline. And you know, we are at this point looking at what four weeks before the training. And so, if we can get going on that, whatever we do, if we can get going on that soon, that'd be preferable. And I think if you, if if there are people that you know that. You, you think would be interested that you can reach out to that helps to move the process along even if they say no I can't but I know someone else you yep. know kind of the word of mouth thing is also see m most most of the time I, I think you, you can get you can get a lot of you can you can get people interested but you have to ask Correct. very very few people will step forward on their own like finance committee but if but if someone gets if someone gets them in, in a in a headlock with an arm twist, they'll usually get members to think. <laughs> but so so and so so Nathaniel, so what you said is is, it, you know, it, it's it's, and the person that would is probably our, that would just hear something and join is probably already involved. But if you really want to try to diverse, you actually going you have to ask some get someone to ask somebody that that's usually how you diversify um and and i don't i don't know but that's how it seems to be that's how it seems to work you, you if if you're waiting for people to come to you by putting out a notice you, you're gonna wait for a long time but if you go ask somebody i think you, and 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 again we we did we did a a, a christmas day meal um and everybody thought it would be a hard thing to do, but we asked. And, and again, but as soon as you asked someone, it was like Bing, Bing, Bing. Every everything fell into order. And everybody and, had a friend they wanted to bring with them, yeah, and yeah. we had and, more and, people. No, I, I, I think you're. I think you're right. I mean, that that is probably the way to get people. It, but you, it doesn't hurt to put out an announcement just so that folks know. But I think that the way you're going to get people to come to the committee is by asking. You have, to, yeah, I think. But but I I just I just skim I I just I I, I love data sometimes, and I scratch my head about, you know, it's like accessibility to town building. Well, we we've had ADA compliance checks, and I mean we except for one building that really we can't get into that that we really don't open. Our buildings are pretty, you know, accessible, and and yet there's still people in here who say, Poof, "I can't," and it's like, I, I don't, I don't understand that. That being said, I, 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 and you read the data as it comes back, and it's, and it's sometimes it's like, how do you penetrate to get the information of what's available? And I guess that's I go keep going back to that. How do you, how to convey? You know, n n right now I know Jennifer is, is at the senior center director is really putting putting out a very uh, in depth um, and concise monthly report, and and sh and she's trying to get it mailed to the seniors in town. Beside people picking it up, and I think that's a, an excellent step. The only the only thing that you have consistent is in the schools. The schools, if you have children in the schools, you can get information yep. about stuff. But after they get out of that Your school kid's going to take it out of their backpack and yeah. give it to him. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it does go home. 
Sometimes. But if you're <laughs> living in Center of your kids go to a different school, you don't get I, I feel in my neighbor all the time, like, because they, they, they chose the neighbor. So yeah. I didn't know there was rec soccer. I didn't know there was rec basketball. I was like, yeah, well, come join us. Right. You know, so you're right. The schools give us time. I know everything going on in the town because of my kids. Right. You I go through the backpack. <laughs> so I guess so, this becomes a question for the three of us. Do we want to each come up with a short list of people we want to ask? Do we want to? Hey, we'll, we'll we'll give uh, yeah give Jeff give Jeff your thing, and I also think we'll talk to uh, the Jennifer at the senior center, to ch and and so she can put the word out. Yep. And I think that's the best way to get you know to get I I think, and then then we can also work. And we get names to Jeff, and we could target target different people. Absolutely, okay. sounds like a plan. Absolutely, good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions for us? Our contact information is on the back slide. Yes. So. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you for accommodating the schedule changes oh, no and everything. Don't, don't even worry thank you for coming in. This was great. I'm glad that you're feeling better. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> We live in interesting times. Yes. Yes. And happy new year. Yes. All right. Thanks, folks. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you for coming in. DLTA, did that something we have to talk about tonight? Uh, yes, because we have to vote on it at the next meeting. So we, we just got it. Um, it's due the, by the 27th. Okay. Um, we don't, I guess we don't have to necessarily discuss it other than I wanted to put it on your radar because it is due. Um, if you want to send me priorities over the next week, I can bring that to the next meeting for discussion. One of the things it, that uh, the planning board requested we apply for is some technical assistance to help amend our zoning bylaws. Have a nice night, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Thanks, Joe. Um, for battery, battery storage facilities. Our zoning bylaw does not currently cover battery storage facilities. There have been inquiries about putting battery storage in Sunderland, so the planning board has requested that we apply for DLTA funds. Now, battery storage, are you talking about, like, solar storage? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Is this for individuals or just for a, a commercial? No, area? I believe this would be a commercial. Okay. Large. Gotcha. Yeah. But, um, other than that, I, I, I don't have any recommendations. Bring the fire department in. To the DLTA? No, if 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 you're talking if you're talking battery storage, battery you want the fire department involved, for sure. Well, the first thing I learned at Porter and Chester when I went for electrician training is everything we do comes from fire departments, comes from the NFPA, comes from someone's house burnt down, so we do it right now. Yeah, I think it's just different equipment and everything you need for. Battery for, for the batteries, it for it's, fire suppression for it. I mean, you don't go and spray water on it. Right. It's yeah. No, it's it's. So yeah, if you, if you all want to take a look at at the different categories and um, send me what you if you have priorities, and then I could put together a list okay. um, for for next week. Okay. Sounds like a plan. And then we certainly don't. The other thing on the agenda was guidelines for the infrastructure gift fund, which it's getting late. We, I wouldn't say it's a priority. We can put that on the next one too. Okay, sounds good. Which so where you want to go now? So In, infrastructure gift fund. If you want to talk about it, happy to. Um, All right, we can leave that. We, okay. You're not anticipating any gifts in the next day or so, are you? No. Well, we got the gift. We just have it. We're not going to spend it. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Select board updates. I got nothing. I'm good. Um, I before this meeting, I was over at uh, the South County EMS meeting um, because I, I I just wanted to talk to the group. Um, so so just so 
the town and other board members are, are aware, we, the assessment was the way the towns are assessed um, is derived out of a formula. And, and basically the formula took, the original formula took into account the, at the number of runs that were, that were made in each town in that, in that time is also based on it and it's it's weighed weighted all these things, but the amount of runs that were being made in each town or number of calls, um, the populations, the EQV, um, the evaluation, um, and and it, so there was a, n a number of things, and and lately, um, I heard a couple. I was talking to a couple of community members from across the river. And they were talking about the South County EMS, and they said, "Well, it's a good program, but it's too bad that um, their community has to support the other two communities." And I said, "Well, I don't quite understand why you're saying that." And he says, "Well, we we all know that you guys have more runs," and and I go, "Well, but that's not true." And so I was talking to Z. Um, who is the uh, director, and he published, and he has, I mean, it's, it's readily available information. So, just so you know, last year, um, the, we, the South County EMS, made a total around a little over 12, 1,200 calls last year. So it was another, another increase, another year of increases. Um, out of that 1,200, about a, th a little over a thousand something were to the three communities. So we do additional calls, uh, intercepts for other mm -hmm. communities. And of the, the, the our three towns, Deerfield, Whiteley, and Sunderland, um, Deerfield assessment is approximately 50, and I'm just going to use rough numbers, 51%. Sunderland is about 31%. And Whiteley is around 15 percent, 16 percent, whatever the math comes out. Now, last year, and I went back over the last from 2022 back to 2017 or 2016, um, Deerfield was paying 51 percent of the cost. Last year, they had 55 percent of the runs. Sunderland had 20. Five or twenty-six percent of the runs, and Whiteley had seventeen, fifteen percent of the runs. So they're all pretty close. But in fact, Deerfield's not subsidizing the program. The town of Sunderland subsidizing the program. Yeah, if you want to look at it at <laughs> someone else's characteristic, yeah. Um, I don't think it's a problem because, and, and, I, and I told the the, I'm amazed. And that's why I said at the meeting over there, I'm amazed that the when we took a shot at trying to make the assessment as fair as possible, we were as close and and, and fluctuates. But right now, those numbers that I just said were been pretty consistent over the years, the last four or five years, yeah. six years. And so, certainly less than it would be to, to maintain our own EMS. Oh my, yeah. yeah. <laughs> By a large well, margin. And I mean, if they want a more fair assessment, they can always do a three year average or something like that. And, and that's, what, that's what Carolyn and, and, and had said. Um, and, and, I, and you could. I, I, I kind of I like the stability of knowing right. from year to year what you're going to pay yeah um and and because you never know what's going to happen you know you could have a a rash of christmas right. day christmas day action it's in your town that's deerfield that wasn't sunderland what are you talking about yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> deerfield's problem <laughs> not mine just remember sunderland residents if you're gonna get an accident go over the border first but i again i i think it you, you know to tell you the truth that it's a really good it's a really good program it, it's yeah. a fantastic program and it shows what what three communities that um, can can get together and offer a program that's probably very very seldom 
you know, we get six uh, six minutes and something seconds, 50 seconds response time. I don't think we have anything to complain about. So. None. Uh, I, again, I, but, but I also, I also, it, it's, it's hard sometimes when you have t the undercurrent that's always exists and I just don't understand why, although if I was a New England Patriot and they out, what to say, the haters will hate, so, yep. I, you know, and haters will hate, so that's all I guess. But I, again, I think the system's working. Um, the call numbers are still going up. When Zach, um, they come and make the presentation, the, uh, Z's going to show the numbers have steadily increased. COVID was a little trying time. People didn't want to use the ambulance or the medical maybe as much, but there's, if it's a, been a pretty solid upward track. So I, that's all I have. Jeffrey? Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention was the MMA annual conference is later this week and into this weekend. Um, so that's exciting. We're going to be in Boston learning about um, what's going on around the state and hopefully have some great ideas to come back with. All right. Anything else? No, sir. Without hearing anything more, all those in, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I motion we adjourn. Seconded. And we have a second, so we have a motion made and seconded to adjourn. Any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Jeff, 3-0, declare us out at uh, 825.